Welcome to episode number 125 of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media and presented to you by our good friends over at SeatGeek. You know, we haven't done this in a while, so I'm looking forward to it. Two for the price of one. I've got a current Atlanta Brave in Tyler Matzik. I've got his former teammate with the world champion Atlanta Braves and a good buddy of mine from his days back in Cleveland, Josh Tomlin. Gentlemen, it is good to see you. Thank you for joining us on the Chris Rose Rotation. But I got to start by saying... Tomlin's got the pro set up. He's got the bats in the background. Yeah. Every, Tyler, do you need saving right now? Are you somewhere where you shouldn't be? Are you on the run or something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I'm at my uh, my little spot here in Atlanta. My uh, see Josh. You know, Josh has the benefit of having you know being retired and uh, hanging out with the family. So he's got his whole setup going in his office. I got in other a little words, bootleg, Santa bootleg Santa office going. What'd you say, Joshy? I said, in other words, Matt's extent, I'm old. Yeah. Well, yeah. we knew that. We knew I, that yeah, going in. I didn't in. say that. He said it. <laughs> do you have, um, Josh, do you have, uh, what, what do you have bat-wise working behind you? Is it? Oh, I, I got a, <clears throat> well, so that was Mike Trout, the one right here, authenticated, I'd say. Um, I Is jammed that one of the him. runs you gave up off of? No, no, I jammed him. One of the only times I've got it, ever got him out. Yeah, he right. wrote on there for me. See, he said, jam, jam. Mike Trout, MVP, all that stuff, all bandicated. <clears throat> and I was joking around with him to Joe Smith whenever they played together. And uh, I said, ask, ask, uh, ask Trout how you like that 88 on the hands. Just kidding around, and he sent me a bat. I loved it. <laughs> it was awesome. That's good. But, yeah, just a bunch of bats. Uh, I got a signed Derek Lowe bat up there. Um, Michael Brantley, Cal Ripken. Um, Cal Ripken? McCann. Yeah, I got a Cal Ripken up there, yeah. Oh, not signed. I got to get that signed, but yeah. Uh, well, you guys share the same barber, so you guys might be able to do, pull that one off. Uh, yeah, Tyler, yeah, if, our, what ourselves? If we were at your regular at your regular off season home, would you have a setup like this? Uh, no, probably not. I mean, that's no. a legit setup. That guy's. I mean, first off, he lives in Tyler, Texas. It's a little cheaper than Southern California, so he can bad, build. Bad, he bad. built this big, big old beautiful house. He tells me about it. He says the most amazing part about his house is his his air conditioning system in that it's like so powerful it opens and closes doors on its own and stuff. <laughs> like, we talk about this stuff in the <laughs> random stuff in like in the bullpen, man. But yeah, he was saying how his air conditioning unit is like unbelievable. It is 15,000 square foot mansion in Tyler, Texas. He's no, he's exaggerating sad bit. Well, I mean, you've got three rug rats running around there. It better be decent size. Yeah, it's got to be big. And, and they they use one portion of the house, so playroom and their bedroom. And that's not even their bedroom. It's more my bedroom. And they tear it. shit up all the time. I have more holes in this sheetrock than I know what to do with. That's my <clears> next <throat> job is construction. I'm getting pretty damn good at it. Nice. Um, yeah, every time I every time I text Tommy, I'm like, hey, man, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm outside gardening, man. I can't be inside that house any longer. Kids <laughs> are throwing things everywhere. It's going crazy. Hey, you want to come back and play? He's like, oh, I'd love to, man. Let's go. Yeah. We started I gotta be honest with a month you. ago. I, I, I got to be honest with you guys. You know, I grew up in suburban Cleveland. All right. Like ritzy neighborhood, the whole bit. My in-laws very early in our marriage, after we got our first house, bought me an electric screwdriver and I started breaking out in the sweats. Like <laughs> no joke. So forget it. You know, my wife looks at me. She's like, well, we have to do this today. And she like, I'll call the handyman. So <laughs> it's probably a good idea. Know. My wife's probably on that same verge. I break more shit than I, I fix most of the time, but it, 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 I, te- I, I learn. I learn from it. Mm-hmm. I get it better. I get it right the next time. So you guys became teammates, I believe, in 2019 in Atlanta. Uh, Tyler, you guys must have hit it off right away. What was it? Yeah, it was 2020. Uh, 2020. I was in AAA in 2019. Um, I don't know. I mean, Tommy's just a great guy. That's what I mean. That's what it is. You know, he's a, I looked at him as like a a mentor of like, Hey, you've been doing this at a very high level for a very long time. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't mean this in a negative way to Tommy, but like with the stuff that Tommy has, or especially at the later end of his career and his ability to stay in the game, like I'm, it's a, you know, I'm just trying to learn from him. Like, how did you stay in the game, throwing cutter sinker, moving the ball all over the place? And, um, you know, I just wanted to learn from him. So it started with that. And then Tommy is just such a good person that he was he was more than happy to to drop some knowledge on me. Josh, what about you? I mean, I remember watching Matzik in um, the ultimate camp and he would come over and did a pitch. He was in the 
third base dugout, third base uh, clubhouse, weren't you, Matt? See the visiting clubhouse? Yeah, yeah. And he would throw against some of our guys. And I can just remember some of the guys I looked at. I'm like, what the shit, dude? That's like 97, 98 with a hammer. That plays no matter where the hell you're at. Like, what is this dude doing in the third base side? Like, that's that was my thinking about, about it the whole time. Um, 19, yeah, I didn't really get a chance to meet him. You came over and played in AAA in 19. You were with some rails first, right? Weren't you? Yeah, I was in Indy Ball still in 19. And yeah. then I came over like the last month, last month, uh, like September, and I was in AAA for a while. But I mean, from from the get go, talking to Matsy, um, kind of hearing about his story a tad bit, it was fascinating what he went, what he'd been through, and then coming back and the type of stuff that he had already, um, and then the stuff he had to deal with off the field and on the field um, from what he dealt with in the past. He says he tried to drop all the knowledge or try to learn from me, but I was just I was trying to do the same thing as him because we all battle those demons on the mound every single time we're out there. You battle some type of demon. It's the loneliest place in the world. I don't give a shit what anybody says. Um, the game doesn't start until you throw the ball. You know, and the game doesn't move unless you throw strikes. Like, and, and action unless you throw strikes. And you, you kind of get that. If you get a sense of like, oh, I'm struggling a little bit. Like, you feel like everybody in the world is staring right at you. But hearing what he had to go through, just talking to him. And then I, he was just an uh, unbelievable human being, first and foremost. But um, he understood what he was trying to do. He had a better understanding who the hell Tyler Massick was now and what made Tyler Massick good. Um, as a matter of fact, some of the stuff I still, when I'm training right now, I think about it, some of the stuff that he tells me about, I want to rotate when my body tells me to rotate. Um, I'm trying to get my arm in a position to whenever I fire, it's in a good position to go. It's not dragging, it's not lagging. Like some of the stuff that he says, I still take to me right, right now when I'm practicing, trying to get ready to go play next year if I do. So it's, I think the relationship hit off from the very get go was we both compete our balls off. Um, we both had to take similar roads. He took a little bit detour than I did. Um, but <clears throat> we weren't highly touted prospects at a certain point, whenever he got called up to the big leagues. Um, but you figure out how to make it work, right? We came into the league as a starter. Um, he had to completely change his whole mindset of going to the bullpen. And my whole thing was like, I had subpar shit that I had to get out the best in the world. And I had to figure out a way. So you had to deal with this mental aspect in different capacities. I get it, but we both had to deal with very high mental capabilities to try to veer our career in a path of where we wanted to go and where we saw it, it potentially could be. Well, today's episode of The Rose Rotation presented to you by your friends over at SeatGeek. So I want you to pay attention. A few special instructions. See this? It's a phone. Go to your app store. Download the SeatGeek app. That is step number one. Step number two, I want you to type in the code word ROSE. You're going to get 20% off of your tickets at SeatGeek with the promo code ROSE. Now, what you shop for is entirely up to you. You want to go check out your favorite baseball team, maybe a visiting players in town. You're like, oh, I really want to check them out. Maybe I heard them on the Chris Rose rotation and I want to yell, you are awesome on the Rose rotation. Once again, entirely up to you. Um, I'm not going to tell you to do that, but if you want to, extra check mark for you. Here's the deal. Go shop for baseball tickets, for the upcoming NFL season, for the upcoming college football season, for your favorite concert, whatever it is. They actually do some homework for you. So they rate every ticket on a scale from zero to 10 to make sure you are getting a good deal. Here's the thing. Green, good. Red, bad. Follow along. Green, good. Red, bad. So maybe if you see me sitting somewhere, there's a red dot next to me. I, I don't know. So once again, go download the SeatGeek app today. Get 20 bucks off your first order with the code word ROSE. I'll see you at the ballgames. Tyler, for people that aren't familiar with your story, I know you've told it a lot, but I think it's really important. This is something we really embrace on the ROSE rotation is how in this sport, above every other sport, have a lot of respect for them, but nobody deals with failure the way that baseball players do. You were, I think, the number 11 overall pick by the Rockies in the draft. Great debut. Then literally you got the yips and you lost it. Why didn't you quit? Uh, I wanted to. I definitely wanted to. Um, you know, the, the most frustrating part for me was that, like, when you get the yips, you don't know what's going on. And you haven't, you, it, it took me a very long time to accept, like, hey, you have the yips. Um, so for 
all of 15, I was like, you know, I, I don't know what's it's something with my mechanics. And then 16, it was like, you know, maybe something's wrong with my arm. Maybe I have thoracic outlet syndrome. And then I do all the tests and it would come back negative. Um, 17, I was like, maybe I have like a brain tumor. Like I went through all of these different things where like, Wait, why you really is, thought you had a brain tumor. I really thought I had a brain tumor. I was like, why is my arm not working the way it has for the first 20 years of 30 years of my life, whatever it was, 25 years of my life. Why is my arm not working the way it is? I thought I had like a nervous, uh, like a nerve injury or a nerve issue, nerve disease. I don't know. Brain cancer, like brain tumor. I had all these things run through my head of like, maybe it's one of these. Um, but what kind of shied me away from that was like, okay, I can do it sometimes and other times I can't. So it's something else. And it just drove me down the line of like, or the path of like, okay, well, let's figure this out. And, you know, it, it finally started to turn around when I just accepted, okay, you have the yips, you have the yips. It's something you got. Let's learn as much as we can about it. Let's figure it out. Let's find all the resources and let's just go full bore at it. And that was in 2000 and probably like late 2017 where I finally was just like, all right, I got some kind of mental block going on. Let's figure it out. When saw a guy named Jason Kuhn, he's a Navy SEAL, ex Navy SEAL. And interesting little side thing about his story is he was a collegiate baseball player. He got the yips. Everyone told him, Hey, you're mentally weak. That's why you can't play baseball. He said, what's the most mentally tough thing I can possibly do on the planet? Well, I'm going to go be a Navy SEAL. So he went and be became a Navy SEAL, had a successful Navy SEAL career, learned a lot of things mentally uh, that he wished he would have known when he was going through the yips. And so he started a company called Stonewall Solution to go ahead and help other athletes and help other teams get through mental blocks and also team camaraderie stuff. Um, got in contact with him and we got to work and, you know, it was a bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, I worked with him for probably a good very closely for probably like six months. Um, and then I contact him all the time now, whenever I need him. And, uh, yeah, he changed my life, man, changed my perspective on, on the world. And I just went full board, any problem I had in front of me. And, uh, just, I think step one of that whole process was accepting that I had the yips two, attacking it. And then three, like finding the people that will actually help you attack that. Um, so yeah, then 2019, the Braves picked me up at Indie ball uh, was okay in indie ball or okay. in uh, when I first, you know, made it to triple a and then 2020 was able to, uh, make the team out of spring training. But yeah, it was, I mean, that's the abbreviated short version of the story. Wow. Um, what a yeah. Bad thing and it was, <clears throat> it was, uh, it was quite a journey. 2017. I didn't play at all. You know what I mean? Like that's when I really thought I was going to give it up. Uh, my wife was just like, Hey, I, I think you have more to offer the game. And then I was like, all right, you know what, if she can, if she's going to stick by my side through all of this, like, oh, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to do it. Let's find whatever resource I can. My uh, ex teammate, Michael McCranier was the one who hooked me up with, with, um, with Jason Kuhn. And from that moment on my life, like just changed in, not, not instantly, but cause it was a hard, a lot of hard work, but that decision to go ahead and go out and meet Jason in person and do that whole thing was what changed my life. It's amazing. Did, did he make you do Navy SEAL workouts and shit? Please tell oh, me. Oh, we that. did a bunch of stuff. Oh, oh yeah. God. Oh, that's so sick. I wasn't, I wasn't playing ball at that point. Like, yeah, I think. Like, I was, I was a nobody. I was at home sitting on my couch for a whole season. He had me doing a whole bunch of stuff. One of the worst things, this is the one I tell because this is the worst, worst thing, is there's a hill that we took us off this land, this big open land. We ran, like, for all day and just – basically, he just tries to beat you up. And – there was this hill that's like a 45 degree hill, maybe a little less. And you take a big, like 15 pound med ball. And Michael McHenry was my, my workout mate. Right. And so he was down there at the bottom doing squats and he had to keep squatting, doing squats as long as I had to push this ball up the hill. Well, you push the ball up the hill, you have to run, stop it. So every time you push it up, it's rolling down. This was miserable, <laughs> but, and I was feeling absolutely terrible. Right. And so the lesson out of this was Jason was standing right next to me and he's yelling at me. He said, you better go because yeah, you're going to be in pain. You feel like shit, you're hurting, but it, it doesn't matter that you're going to be hurting. You're going to hurt because you're going to get this done no matter what, but what you can do, what you can control is how much pain your, your teammate is in. He's in pain. The faster you go, the quicker he's out of pain. You're going to be in pain period. No matter what, the faster oh. you go, the, the quicker he's out of pain. 
So it was little lessons like that, where we were doing through physical pain and all that stuff, um, that it was just one of the building blocks that he, he had me going. He also had me doing, you know, he'd have me run and do a bunch of just exercises to get me super fatigued, super tired, super, uh, just not like in it, lethargic, nauseous, whatever. And then he's want me to do a finite motor skill. So we were, we were in a gun range. And so he's like, all right, I want you to take the pistol. I'm a decent shot. And I want you just to hit that target. And it's easy to do when you're feeling fine, feeling comfortable, everything's going well and you feel good. You're just showing up to a gun range. But when you are absolutely exhausted and everything's shaking, your body's feeling terrible, you feel like you're going to throw up, the simple task of just shooting a little target becomes extremely hard. So how do you control and calm your mind down to get to a point where you can go back to making it a very simple task? And it's the same thing when you're out on the mound playing, you know, if you're in a bullpen, it's easy just to throw a strike. But when you get out there, you get all this energy, all these people, you got the situation, you have the hitter, you have the umpire, you have the mounds messed up, all this stuff. How do you just simplify and go, I'm going to do my, do what I need to do. I need to hit the target. I'm going to figure it out. That's how I'm going to do it. Cool. There's adversity. Sounds good. Let's do it. Stuff like that, man. Yeah. So, I mean, that was like a couple of things, but yeah, he, he, that's just a small example, but yeah, it was, it was things like that. I love that. Josh, you know, last year, unfortunately you, you had a banged up neck, so you couldn't participate in the postseason world series run, but how much joy knowing Tyler's story, did you get with him being as dominant as he was in October? Oh, I have chill bumps in my body thinking about it. It's, it's incredible. It's so I would go down the bullpen about the third inning every so almost every game until the last couple of games in Dodger Stadium um, or against the Do- was Dodgers that I would be like, you know what, I'll, I'm just going to stay in the dugout. I just want to watch. I just want to watch from the dugout. Well, I want to watch when Matt, when Matzik, um, whenever um, Will Smith, Wait, I want to watch those well. guys come in. Like, I, I just want to watch those guys come in because it, the, the energy we've always we had down there all year long was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. You, I mean – Anytime Massey would make a big out or meant make a big out in the playoffs when you're down there, I bet we're screaming, jumping, and just as loud as the dugout than anybody else. Like, it's incredible. The atmosphere, the energy, the camaraderie that was down there. It's, it's, it's amazing. And I'm still sure it's the same way right now. But um, I, I get chill bumps watching this right now uh, on our screen. With that. But that's – I'm guessing you could – yeah, he almost clipped you right there. I know um, he did. <laughs> I was scared about that one. <laughs> and then Jock does that. And I'm like, what are yeah. you doing? Everything's going right. All right. Yeah. But yeah, it's, um, you know, being a part of the World Series before, Rosie, and I'm sorry to disappoint you on this, but in losing it, having that second place ring and watching these guys go out there and bust their, bust their asses and compete their asses off to, to get this championship was one of the, it was just as satisfying as the one we lost with me participating in it. Like this is satisfying for me to go participate in the one we lost as it was to just not participate at all and, and, um, and go win it. It was, it's incredible, man. It was absolutely incredible. All right, guys, here's the deal. I care about you. I care about your health. I want you to be healthy when it comes to that one-on-one time with that someone special. And that's where getroman.com can lend a helping hand. Don't be embarrassed by this talk we're about to have. Some people, they get a little too excited before they're ready. Are you following me? Well, here's where GetRoman.com can help you out. Order up your Roman swipes. They are clinically proven to help you last longer in bed. You can enjoy it. That someone special can enjoy your time together. And it's not two minutes and we move on to the next thing. Here's the cool thing. No prescription is needed. I'm going to repeat that. No prescription needed. All PE treatments, they are safe. They are effective. They are used by millions of men. So don't feel bad here. You are not alone. You are fighting this fight together. On top of that, when you order it, guaranteed two-day free shipping. So here you go. Get Roman.com slash Rose today. If approved, you're going to get 10 bucks off of your first order. That is get Roman.com slash Rose. Believe me. You'll be lasting longer. You're going to walk around with more confidence. And that someone special is going to look at you and say, let's play two today. So obviously we've hit some heavy shit, but I need to know down there in the bullpen, who is the guy um, that you needed to tell shut up? Because there's always one guy back back there who will not stop Luke talking. Jackson. I'll, I'll say it before Matthew. It's Luke Jackson. The I three. mean, 
<laughs> I would say Luke and even like Lee, Dylan Lee. Oh, uh, Dylan. And it came into like sometimes Dylan, like he gets he gets very when he gets nervous, he starts getting really talkative. And so we like it started as a joke. Should I say? I'm gonna say it. it started as a joke, and it was like Dylan, you need to like a timeout, like go go take a piss, go take a shit, whatever, go sit in the bathroom. So he'd like go in there, he'd take his piss, calm down. And I don't remember how it started, but like we uh, scored a run. So we're like, Dylan, you got to go back in there. And then it turned into him basically spending three fourths of the playoffs, like in the bathroom, in the shitter, because we just kept scoring runs whenever he was in there. So we were like, hey, rally, everybody rally dip. No, 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 no rally dip. Lee, get in the shitter. And then boom, instantly (laughs) three runs. So when Lee goes home, Lee goes home and all his friends are like, hey, man, how was uh, how was the playoffs? Man, it was a great experience. He's like, honestly, I didn't really watch much of it. I was in the shitter the whole time. Just <laughs> he kept scoring runs. What a story and they kept sending to tell, me in there. What a oh, story man. to tell. But he's awesome, man. Dylan Lee's a great, great human being. Uh, it was just a superstitious thing where it was like every time he went to the bathroom, we scored a run. So, um, yeah, it was – I mean, Luke – Luke runs his mouth too, that's for sure. But he's more of like like – you know, like you said, he's more of a punching bag. So everybody just gangs up on him and he takes it really well. So well, what, what do we say to him? Uh, it's what he brings it on himself. You know, he, he says he's the most jacked human being on the team. You know, we got yeah. Solaire, like the guys like chiseled yeah. out of marble. And we're going to go ahead and say Luke Jackson is in better shape than that. Come on, guy. There's just no way. Haircut. He says he's the sexiest man alive. Like, he's like yeah, look he at my says, look at this. Like, he no, he'll still say he's number two. He'll still say number two. He's like, if he gets a haircut, he'll get he'll get trimmed up. He'll say, all right, Doobie still has me beat. Yeah, Doobie but has I'm number me, two. Yeah. I passed Dansby Swanson. We're like, Luke, you you do yeah. not pass Dansby Swanson. That guy's a model. What are you talking about? Does does Dansby know it too, or is he kind of humble about it? I mean, if you went and looked in the mirror and you look like him, you kind of know, it, Rosie, wouldn't you? Yeah, he knows it. He's got he's got he's humble, but he knows. Yeah, it's a silent confidence. Well, see, I work with Trevor Plouffe every day on Baseball Today. That's the other podcast I do. He is not humble about it. He is not okay. ab- yeah. about his male model looks. So, okay. yeah, it's just kind of how we roll through it. <laughs> I wouldn't be. You know? I'm um, not. Josh, what was your reaction when your former teammate, Jock Peterson, got slapped in the face by Tommy Pham? Oh, boy. That. What the hell, Jock? Do something back? First and foremost, what the hell are you doing letting somebody bitch slap you and you walk away from it? Just kind of stay, you shitting me? That's number one. Number two, I knew it was going to happen. I saw the text message. I saw the text. In the, hold on. You weren't in the, in the league. league. I'm, not, no, I'm not in the league. No. Okay. No. This has been going uh, on. This was going on for a very long time. This was going on. This is going on in the playoffs. Last year. Or not before so the we, playoffs. We, we, yeah. we, would, we would hear about this in our, in our clubhouse before yeah. this ever happened. And the biggest one was when we went to San Diego that end of the year and he literally did not leave the clubhouse. Chop did not leave the clubhouse because he knew Tommy Pham was out there and Tommy Pham wanted to slap him and beat him up. And so he just stayed inside <laughs> the clubhouse, didn't take BP for three days, just hid inside the cage and then would come out to the game. It was fantastic. So the whole clubhouse, everybody knew this. And he thought that it had like, you know, Tommy left the, or that Pham had left the league and like he was good to go, came out. And then, yeah, Pham, what a drug Pham still hold, wanted though, right? that. Yeah. What? what a grudge to hold. I mean, that's been a year in the making, and he just said, walked up to him and bitch slapped him. Well, there had to be some serious cash on the line. I'm sorry. Oh, no doubt. Oh, Jock doesn't do anything without serious cash on the line. I was taking Jock's money in poker or whatever card game we were playing on the plane whenever he sent that text message. And he was like, look, he says some bitch slapped me. He's like, I didn't do anything wrong. He's like, I just I stashed the play on the IR or whatever the hell that the whole thing is. And I don't know all the rules behind all this stuff. Like, I don't know what the, all I say, man, is are you really trying to even win your league if you're not willing to take a slap in the face for an IR stash? Yeah. You no, know? like, <laughs> like, hey, if they were like, hey, you want to stash somebody on your thing and take a slap, I'm like, shoot, let's go, guys. I'll let all yeah. other 11 guys in the league, let's go, give me a slap. If it means me winning that league, I'm in. So he really didn't want to leave the clubhouse in San Diego? No, he didn't. He didn't leave the clubhouse. He did not leave it. No, he did not leave it. <laughs> he stayed in the clubhouse. <laughs> it was fantastic. Did either of you text him when after this happened? Uh, uh, No. Or do you just let uh, it be? I should have. I I wanted to. I still might. It's still going. I mean, I still see stuff on it every now and again. Like Sports Center will put something like the right. The the Giants have. uh, It's not illegal to stash players in the IR or something like that. Right. Yeah, Uh, they had T-shirts. T-shirts made. (laughs) 
It's bad. Well, Tommy didn't let that go, right? He, he just, it's like fuel in the fire for that guy, I feel like. You guys both play, though, don't you? Fantasy? I play every now and then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Matt, uh, you are all of a sudden your face got very serious. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, Tammy, uh, Tommy doesn't play. Uh, I play. I mean, he's not in our league. You were in our league last year, right? No. No, no, no. I was in the year, I was, the year before I was in the league with somebody. Um, uh, I split it with somebody. I, I don't pay attention to it, man. I usually I'm, I'm in the offseason, I'm hunting, I'm doing something else. And I, like, I don't want somebody calling me and be like, hey, man, I want to trade. I'm like, I don't even know who the hell I have on my team. Dude, you're that's from freaking in- Tyler, Texas. I mean, that's yeah, all they I, do is talk football down there. I agree. I agree. But not me. I, I, I go in the woods. I try to get in the woods. Bro. I get away from all that shit as much as I can in offseason. <laughs> like, as far as pro athletes from Tyler, Texas, it goes Earl Campbell and then Josh Tomlin. That's well, it. it did. Yeah, right. Who the hell is that? AJ Minter right underneath there. Uh, AJ. Yeah. Tom, Tommy's, Tommy's uh, little pupil is bringing up. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then Patrick Mahomes, who the hell is that? He might be somebody. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that time. guy. Yeah, I yeah. guess he's okay, too. Yeah, You're he's not bad. Quarterbacks that earn $500 million and can <laughs> throw it 78 yards, I guess. Tyler, what's yeah. your uh, fantasy football game like? Solid? Pretty good, yeah. I had. A, I mean, I got third in our uh, league. Oh, geez. In, uh, Let me guess. One of, the, one of the trainers won it. No, 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 no. That's, that's, it, uh, that's all the Rolex raffle. That's, that's what they always win magically. They always win the Rolex raffle that they – Send out p bat raffle. What, what's the Rolex raffle? Uh, it's, a, donation. it's like a do- yeah. yeah, it's a donation thing. It's like a it's just, it helps the um, uh, what do they call them? The p bats or not p bats? Um, it helps the medical trainers basically with like a foundation where you oh, give in for a raffle and they give out a player gets a, a Rolex, is basically what it is. So you're just donating money to the trainers and stuff. That's nice. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, all right. So, Matic, let's get back to your game. You finished third. Yeah, I finished third this year. Um, I think I would have gotten – I should have gotten second or first, honestly. But that last that last week, uh, the week before going into – what would that be? That'd be semifinals? Semifinals week, uh, Travis Kelsey had a close contact, COVID. Oh, yes. And uh, if he would have played, I, I really am confident that I would have actually been able to come out. I think I lost by seven points. So – and I forgot my tight end got like three points that week or something. Hey. So, you know, if he would have gotten 10 points, I would have been in the finals. And I feel like I would have had a pretty good shot at, at getting first place. But and who who won? Luke Jackson won. Oh, no, God. He did but, not. but here's the best he looking did. person won. in America. Yeah, he won. He won. But oh, my God. Was, Is he talking so much shit this year? Oh, yeah. He's, he's like, dude, I'm, I got a dynasty fantasy team. This is the third time in seven <laughs> years or something like this. He's just running his mouth. Of course he is. But the thing is, is his dad runs his team for him. No doubt. He sits, I sit, you know, in our draft, in our draft, we have everybody. We got pizza. We got beer. We're hanging out. Boys, we got this big draft board. Everyone's sitting at the table. Luke is on his computer and on the phone in the corner going like this, typing on the computer on the phone with his dad by himself and we start throwing pizza at him throwing crap he can't get up from his computer because he's tied into the wall and it's fantastic but yeah his dad basically runs his team for him luke doesn't do anything and um yeah he just takes all the glory but he doesn't his dad runs it for him i love that by the way i feel your pain on the kelsey thing my 16 year old son got screwed for the same thing he was so Mm -hmm. pissed he came home from school he's like dad fucking kelsey he's (laughs) close contact i'm like not even sick he's close contact come on i know I know, really. What was know. the rules behind that? If someone could you, was that one of the reasons why Fam got mad? Is can you stash him on the IR for that, or just like you just have to drop him? No, no, no. There was like a COVID. Well, our league, we had uh, if he was a COVID, we had like a COVID IR, so you could stash yeah. as many players as you want on the IR if they were had a COVID designation on them. Yeah, gotcha. that was just our league, but every league had a different thing. It's a, it was a weird, weird thing. Hey, you been paying attention? Baseball card business is booming yet again, and Greg Moore's cards. It is the most trusted sports card seller on the entire planet. Get these stats. They sell over 80,000 sports cards every month. I'll save you the math. That's about 2,000 per day, and it happens exclusively on eBay. GMC sells baseball cards from every era, the pre-war, post-war, modern era. So you're probably asking yourself, why in the world do people trust GMC for buying cards? Well, Greg Morris and his outstanding team, they hand grade each and every card they sell. So buyers, they've been trusting Greg's grades for years. If Greg says they're mint, guess what? They're mint, baby. 
So go to gregmorriscards.com to check out the entire inventory. In fact, GMC wants to give you a $10 in free cards just about hearing us here on John Boy Media. So go to the website. It is gregmorriscards.com to find the cards you want. And if you win the eBay auction, you message them with the code John Boy. You're going to get 10 bucks off of your order. Go enjoy today. You guys both had really special Major League debuts. I want to start with you, Josh, since you got there first. Dude, I remember <laughs> this. Two hit, seven shutty against the Yankees. Now, you, everybody that's ever been a teammate says the same thing about you. You got the biggest brass balls ever. <laughs> Please tell me that you were like tinkling a little bit in your pants against them. Oh, the, hell yeah. The, one of my favorite players ever was Derek Jeter. That's the first pitch I ever threw in the major leagues. It was just, I, I don't know, man. It was, but. For, by the grace of God, my parents were watching you pitch in AAA um, the week before that. And um, Charles Nagy told me on that Wednesday or whatever it was, he said, hey, you're going to go pitch in the big leagues in a couple of days. Don't tell anybody. They haven't made a move. Um, but I know your parents are in town. They want to stay an extra few days to go watch. I was like, oh, dude, appreciate it. So I went and told my mom and dad. And um, my, my dad was just basically saying, like, hey, F fuck it you know <laughs> basically he was trying to tell me like they put their pants on the same way most of them have to go through the minor leagues the same way if you weren't you didn't belong in where you're going then they wouldn't have called you up period don't sit there don't don't overthink this shit go throw strikes and see what happens it's like hell those guys are up, up there playing defense behind and get paid a hell of a lot more money than you do make them work and i was like okay shit but yeah i was still still this day I, that's one of the one of my best moments in my in my entire life was um getting to share that with them for one and um, pitching against Derek Jeter, a -Rod was going for a 600 home run, and I had no fucking clue. Um, Tom Izania, uh, I think it was, or was it Dan? Yeah, Izania, the umpire, came out. Dan Izania, yeah. Yeah, Izania. He came out and gave me a ball. I said, like, what is this? He's like, it's Mark in case a -Rod hits a 600 home run or whatever it was. And I was like, what the shit? I was, so I looked around, I was like, I, I was looking about so many people here. I thought they came to watch the kid pitch. Sure, shit. They were coming to watch uh, A thought get his uh, 600 home run. And he didn't have got it. But um, no, I mean, it was. They, it saw, was they saw your triple A stats and they said, this guy gives up more home runs than home walks. Runs oh, bring walks. him up. Let's get this thing going. <laughs> yeah. this is a Let's get this over with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love no, it. No, it, uh, it was incredible, man. Um, yeah. Uh, got the pitch against CC. At the, I'm pitching the eighth inning. I, I couldn't believe it. that's the that's the longest outing I've had in AAA. I think I had one. No, I didn't have a complete game in AAA that year. I don't think. And I actually started here in the bullpen that year in AAA. Pretty good. I remember it well. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, your yours came against a team you play for now, right? The Atlanta Braves. You worked into the eighth in that one. I think you held them to one run or something like. Oh, look at you. Little know, baseball America boy. prospect getting Freddie Freeman looking. Uh, first <laughs> strikeout. That, make, that was your first strikeout? Yeah, I, I tell him all the time when I saw him. <laughs> Anytime he would talk crap to me, I just say, Freddie, you're number one in the book, man. Just want to let you remind you of that. You're number one. <laughs> what do you, you remember? Probably most could say exactly what pitch you do, too. What I remember most, man, I remember honestly like not feeling my body like it, it's like a you're like almost numb and tingly you're just like so have so much like energy and excitement going for like the first I don't know probably two innings and then by like the third fourth inning I started settling in and then I was I started realizing like all right like, I can get these guys out like I'm I've been doing it not even being able to feel my body and now I'm doing it you know starting to get into my groove starting to feel it and uh yeah I mean it was a big moment I had my family there um, all the people that had supported me, you know, growing up and, and going through all those baseball tournaments and all that stuff growing up. Um, so it was just a special moment for me and the family. And, you know, it's amazing to do it against the team I play with now and actually was able to uh, win a World Series with. So it was a great experience. And, man, look at me. I'm a little fresh-faced little baby right there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was a great experience, man. It was, it was one of those things where, like, you're never going to forget that day. It was an absolutely amazing day for me. And, I loved every minute of it. That's cool to look at. By the way, I, I want to jump back to the World Series from last year for you. Based on the bumpy road you traveled to get back, living in an RV, playing independent ball, visiting a Navy SEAL to make you mentally and physically strong, were you able to take a second? Because I don't think we do this enough in life. I don't care whether it's athletes, 
podcast hosts, anybody. We don't take enough time to appreciate the journey. Did you take a second in the World Series and say, fuck yeah, I am back, dude? I think it was right after the World Series. Like, you're so focused on, like, just the next pitch every single you know, during while you're playing during the World Series, like you, you look at it as like a hole and then you break it down all the way from the pitch. But when I when we were able to win it and I was able to step back and go like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe like it's a team thing. But I can't believe I was a part of a team that went on to win the World Series coming from where I was like that was my like aha, like shocking moment, especially the parade. It really hit. And it was like, wow, like you sit back. and It's just a day of reflection, basically, of like how the whole season went and you can go back and like how everybody on one of those buses had a crazy journey to get to be on a perfect team to go ahead and win a world series like that. Not the truly, journey you had brother. No, but a lot of them have some journeys, man. Like, I mean, I did, I had an extraordinary journey. Sure. But you know, there's a lot of guys who have gone through some crap and we have one of the more unbelievable things. You look at our roster, our team, we had a lot of first rounders who were kind of like bust first rounders that were just like, the talent was there, but for whatever reason, we couldn't do it. And um, it all just, everybody came together and like, just got comfortable with each other. And we we're able to, to, you know, be able to have the talent, you know, like you got a guy like Luke Jackson, like he was a starter. He threw a hundred miles an hour. He was okay. And then he goes out and has an unbelievable year that year, just because who knows why, you know what I mean? Like there was stories just like that. Like he, the first time I met Luke, he told me like, Hey man, congratulations. I'm making it up here. I'm glad you're on our team. I might have somebody who actually has more walks than me this year. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, in single A, it was me and you were like always at the top of the list on who had the most walks for the season. And I'm like, Oh shit. So, I mean, like, you know, it's like not everybody has, you know, a perfect path and I'm the only one that doesn't. Um, but yeah, to look back and reflect at like, like you said, like living in a trailer, living, Traveling the environment we bus. created in that clubhouse, Rosie, is it's incredible. It really is. Nobody's yeah. safe. You can talk shit to anybody. Um, but the Freddie Freeman down to the Josh Tomlins, like anybody was fair game, right? Everybody was fair game. But at the end of the day, everybody knew, even if you were talking shit to them, there might be a small hint of truth of what they were saying to you to try to get your ass in gear. But there was also that, hey, I got you. I'm here with you. I'm, I, we're, do, we're going through this together. Like there was none of this shit that, you know, somebody was going for accolades or somebody was going for numbers. It was none of that bullshit. It was just, hey, what the fuck can we do today to be better than that team by one run? Period. That's it. That's the only thing we gave a shit about. That way we could get back into the bar and have a few drinks after the game. Right? Like it was just and, and hang out and talk and bullshit and reflect on the game. Like that's the only thing that we cared about was going out there and trying to beat the shit out of whoever we were playing on any given day. And it wasn't like a, you know, I haven't done anything in five days, uh, six days, you know, but I'm still in the game. I'll go here and talk to Massey or Massey hadn't pitched in four or five days. I'm going to come here and talk to Max or Tomlin or Dansby. Like it wasn't like pitchers were on one side of the room and position players on the other side of the room and nobody talked. That's how the locker room's kind of set up. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, hell, after the game, we'd have Dansby. We'd have all kinds of position players over there while we'd all mingle um, in the corner of a bar, a corner of our bar, corner of the locker room, have a few drinks and talk about the game reflect on it and talk about any kind of situations we saw or any kind of um, tendencies that were trending in that direction of like how we can, you know, combat that, combat them and be better. It's incredible. It's one of the better teams I've ever, it is the best team I've ever been on. And we won 88 games and ended up dominating the postseason. I yeah. Love that. I think where it all starts to is like where you can get comfortable with a guy to tell them that if they're doing something wrong or they're doing something right, but you have to first let that person know that you love them as a human being first off. And then that when you, so that way you have some credibility when you go ahead and try and help them out with whatever thing. And you also be also be able to receive that information as well as give it out. And I think that's what, one of the best things on our team is like, like he's saying, like we'd sit down, we'd have drinks and we not always were we talking about the game. Sometimes we were just talking about like, Hey man, how's life going? Yeah. We'd ask about uh, Tomlin's daughter's dance recitals and just stuff like that. And it's just, it, it lets them know that like, Hey, you're a human being first. I, you're a friend of mine first. And then like, Hey, if we need to talk about baseball or whatever, we talk about baseball and that would go further because you have that connection, that human connection first off. It's trust. Um, the amount yeah, of trust. trust. The amount of trust that team special, special, man. Yeah. It's very, very special. I love to hear that. Thank you for taking us inside there, guys. Tyler, how much of a badass is Ronald Acuna? 
what is it? Give me one thing that we can't see as fans that you do as a ball player. And you're like, awesome. Yeah, he's got it all, man. Like, he really does. Like, he's – every year, man, I'm, I'm waiting for him to get a 40-40 season because I really think that he can it's do happening. it. He's healthy. He is going to happen. He's – he looks like he's just out there, like, playing wiffle ball, man. It's like the game is so easy to him. He doesn't – it doesn't speed up on him, which is amazing for how young he is. Like, we all forget it's still how young he is. You know, he's been in the league for, I think, three, three years now, three and a half years, and, like, you know, he's the same age as – a lot of these guys like Tatis and all these guys. And it's like, yeah, but that's because Ronald was here a little bit before those guys. So, you know what I mean? Like we forget that Ronald's the same age as them. Um, and he's just, he's a Supreme talent. That's what it is. I mean, he's a true five, five tool guy and he's quiet. He goes about his business. He's very mature. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, he's got a great mentor in Ozzy that's able to, to kind of help him um, help him on his way. He had Ender there in the beginning too. Ender was helping him out a ton. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the future is so bright for that kid. He's just, again, he's a supreme talent. It's unbelievable to watch. He surprises me every day I go on the field, you know, I, every day I go on the field, I'm like, wow, I can't believe he just did that. You know what I mean? And there's only one other player that I've watched like that. And that was Nolan Arenado when he would play third base. I'm like, I, this guy is just hands head and shoulders better than everybody else on the field defensively like you know so you know when you're in the presence of guys like that you just sit back and watch and enjoy the moment you want to if you ever get a chance for this you ought to go watch uh Acuna take BP he doesn't ever hit a ball out to like left down the left field to or even like straight up left field it's from center field to the right field line and they are absolute like freaking like oh, Russell Brannion taking like a softball bat, hitting balls with a golf ball. They're incredible. He's hitting balls in like the third deck in the right center field in certain stadiums. It's absolutely one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in my life. It's incredible. Uh, it took 125 episodes, but we finally got our first Russell Brandy Russell- <laughs> on the Rose Rotation. Nice work. I was just trying to think of like a beer league softball dude. Hey, just sit there like, oh. Nailed oh dude, you, you know? nailed it. I'm still waiting for Russell Brandy to break out. As a Cleveland fan, I'm still waiting. It's going to happen one of the years. He might be 67 by the time it happens, but damn it, but it it'll is going happen. happen. Damn it. Uh, do you have your ring, Tomlin? Yeah. Oh, I got to see this bad boy. Yeah, just hold that there for a sec. Oh, Tyler, have you worn yours out in public? Uh, I wore it one time. We went to the Hawks basketball game uh, for their playoffs, and they told us to wear them and bring them. So. That's the only time I've worn it outside of uh, the stadium in the house. That is gorgeous. And what – Millar always used to wear it when we were on road trips in Boston because – not because he was like, hey, I'm Kevin Millar. I helped break the 86-year curse. He, under, <laughs> he started to understand how much it means to people yeah. when they get mm-hmm. a chance to see something like that. And I'm just telling you, whenever you guys go out to functions, it's not like, oh, God, I don't want to be that guy. Look at that. That is just sensational. Um, we as fans, we're not privy to that, dude. So you're going to get some amazing reactions. It means so much to us as fans. We pour so much of our heart and soul into what you guys bring us, how much joy you bring us. So that I just want you to understand that. Yeah. I've never thought of it like that. I've always just thought yeah, about, like, I don't want this to, I don't want to lose this or break it or. <laughs> Or someone it. chop my finger off for it. Well, that's true. Somebody might do that. You might be walking around with nine digits at some point. Yes. Oh, yeah. If it makes me sink the ball a bit better, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Got like, like a mean like Vulcan chain. <laughs> I just started missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, Josh, how did you make it? Like you, you threw 88, basically. I mean, look at where we are, where we've come in this sport in the last 10 years. Like, if you don't throw 95, see ya. You're gone. Well, yeah, I, that, no doubt. That, that's, and that's only going to get worse, I think. But I, th- I take that back. I think the trend you see in baseball always catches up to itself, right? Like, hitters can hit a bullet out of a gun if they know where it's going to be. I truly believe if you go watch all the successful postseason teams over the past 10 years, right, five or seven to 10 years, when this velo started, you know, kind of taking a jump that instead of five guys in the league going 100, there's 55 guys in the league going 100 now. 
I truly think that once you get into a playoff setting, when all these games truly are magnified, I feel like no matter what, strikes and location is key. Mm-hmm. It's, it's king. It always will be. If, if you get a guy, um, I think Lackey's, uh, John Lackey said it one time, he, he said, crowd gets loud, you get soft. And because there's, there's high intensity, there's every, everybody wants to go. Everybody wants to get their bat over with, but they want to do something big. So everybody's, everybody's muscles and fast twitch uh, fibers in their body is ready to go. So slow them down. you got to rock them back and forth. Well, um, if you're not throwing strikes and you're not throwing, you know, the ball in the corners or you don't have high below that you can command a little bit in the zone, it, you're going to get hit, Right. Like Max's big thing is he can command the ball both sides of the play, but he can elevate as well. He can elevate, keep the ball. You know, he, he has the ball that goes actually through the zone. If it didn't, if it wasn't a catch there, it would keep rising up in space, right? It's just a different kind of fastball. If you don't have that different kind of fastball and you're throwing 100 or 95 and you're just throwing the ball down the middle, hitters are going to make you pay eventually. Um, but I feel like for me, that was, I was always taught that. I was never. You know, I was never fortunate enough to throw 100. Now, don't get me wrong. Every fucking pitch out there, I try to throw 100 miles an hour. Every single one. I tried to. You know, don't, 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 don't let me fool you. I'm not, I wasn't trying to sink the ball out down away and, you know, cut the ball just off the play. I was trying to throw every pitch I could 100 miles an hour. But I knew that if I had, if I was going to do that, I had to train my body, train my size, train my arm to be able to get to the point where my mindset was, I'm not going to mess over the middle. I might miss over the middle every now and again, but it's probably because I started the ball, you know, I tried to backdoor cut and I just kind of, I yanked it a tad bit trying to be too fine. But I, I was a firm believer and I, I figured this out when I was in the minor leagues that if I just stared where I wanted to go, I always made, I made more mistakes. So I just wanted to be athletic. I wanted to see, I saw fastball way. I told my body fastball way. My brain, you know, saw the catcher set up and I looked down and I'd come back up, I'd catch it. So that made my body athletically moved to the area I was going to. My body, my brain just said, okay, that's where it goes. It instinctually went to that area. So that's, I feel like that's one of the biggest reasons why, I, for one, the moment never got too big for me because I, I, I genuinely was thinking, okay, fastball down away. Okay, look down, look up. But well, that is, go throw. <clears throat> like my, I guess you can call it a flow state where you just kind of get locked in, was so intensified when I was in the mound that I, and I mean this from, from the bottom of my heart, and I don't know if it's good or bad. I can truly not tell you one pitch I've ever thrown in the big leagues. And I probably haven't gone and watched any of them. I just, I get so locked into what I have to do. And it's so hard for me to have to stay that locked in that hmm. once I do, it just, it just, I just take off. Like in, my instincts just kick on. And then when the game's over with, I'm just like, I'm mentally gone. I'm mentally exhausted, drained, everything. It takes every ounce of my body away from me. Um, but yeah, I, yeah that's, that's interesting. It's like a, I'm, I'm going to vote in here because that's an yeah. amazing thing because I've never heard you say that, but when you go through all the mental stuff, your, your memories are tied to emotions, right? And so that means that you aren't remembering any of the pitches that you're making because you've taken emotions out of your decision-making when you're mm-hmm. going out there and pitching. It's simply just A plus B equals C. You know what right. I mean? You're one, two, three, see the pitch, throw the pitch. You don't have any anxiety. You don't have any stress. You, don't, you aren't happy about your pitch. You aren't sad about your pitch. You're just like out there going through and you're just accomplishing that task, which is really an amazing thing. Like you said, you're in that flow state where your, your emotions are almost turned off, which is a very hard thing for human beings to do. And that doesn't attach the emotions doesn't don't attach to that memory, which is really impressive. That's kind of how you want to be. You want to no, you, that's usually why never... you remember a pitch. It's either, you know, nine times out of 10, it's a negative emotion that we're Correct. attaching to that pitch. You give up a home yeah. run or you give up a, you know, whatever you lose the game, you know, very rarely do we attach positive emotions. So it's better to just take your emotions out of the decision-making and just go ahead and get in that flow state and just do your, do the action. No, that, that's, that's one of the biggest reasons I think that Rose, you've watched you play in Cleveland for a long time. I've, I've never show emotions in the field. For one, yeah. I got my ass beat <clears throat> or spanked whenever I was a kid. My dad, whenever I threw a bat, my struck out when I was a kid and I never wanted that to happen again. I learned real quickly, but it was also, I never want anybody to understand that, they, they've either gotten to me or that I'm better than them. I never wanted to show anybody up for one. And I never wanted anybody to think that they, they were getting under my skin. Right. So my, my whole mindset on the mound was, okay, pitch, go ball, pitch, ball, go. Like that's, that's it. That's the only thing I ever, that I ever thought about on the mound. If I, you know, if I threw a no hitter, a perfect game, whatever the case may be, it would simply be, I turn around and get the ball and say, shake your hands. I'm supposed to do that. Now, when I get in the clubhouse, I will have a good time with it. 
like I, I enjoy it. I, I try to remember it or I try to go over it and, and try to soak it in because I agree with you, Rosie. I don't think we ever take enough time to realize what kind of state like your, your, your body and your mind have to get to to be able to perform there. Like one of the loneliest places in the mound or in the world is on the mound, but this is the place I feel the most comfortable. And it always has been. And that's probably one of the biggest things I miss about not playing. And my, and my wife asked us the other day, do you miss it? I'm like, oh, yeah, I miss it. If I played for 20 more years and I retired, I'd, I'd still be 75 years old. I still, I still miss it. I'm always going to miss it. But, um, yeah, man, it's like if I can, as long as I can take the emotion out of the things and, and, and just move forward instead of thinking about all this stuff in the past, because I felt like once video started getting prevalent in the game, you saw a bunch of young guys, the first thing they ever go do, go do is go to the video room and go, look what I'm doing. And it was always something negative that they were doing. Instead, you'd be like, fuck that, dude. Hey, hang on. Let's go find the game where you struck out the side uh, two, two weeks in a row, whatever. Let's go find that. Let's watch that. Let's try to build off that. Not, 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 don't put this bad shit back in your brain and then let it just you know, play circles. Because like, the bad shit get put, to, put on repeat. And the, the good stuff is like a, it's a single. It's a big hit for a couple of couple of turns then you go boom it's a gone wait till i can have to go back to it in a couple more weeks or a couple more months but the bad shit's like it's on repeat man it's on spotify just boom 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 constantly 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 and i just could never deal with this so i i just cut it all out I try to cut it all out it's really good stuff guys really interesting tyler i know you got to go throw a bullpen but i got like two more things and we'll get you out of yeah, here yeah. i promise hey, nice, uh, baseball dude. um i love the players they can also be the most immature people I've ever met in my life, uh, in a good way. Who was the first person that ever called you nutsack? <laughs> Nobody ever said the, the, the first person said to my face because the first person that ever said it was Luke. He tweeted it to my face. Like no kid it was like Matzik nutsack. No. Oh, as no a one? kid, as a kid. No, no, no. As a kid, they called me. <laughs> They called you the ball called sack? Balls. Yeah, they just took mats out and put ball and sack. So they just called me ball sack. Oh, okay. And so then I, my name, like growing up through high school and all this stuff, they just changed it to sack. And I was like, okay, well, so I've been known as with my group of friends back home as, as sack for the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, like ever since I was about 12 years old. Um, but, you know, that, that's them. And then Luke obviously was the first one to write, you know, nut sack or anything like that on Twitter. And then it kind of caught on. And so everybody asks, you know, my wife, like, Hey, how do you feel about being known as Mrs. Nutsack? And she's like, honestly, like she's known me for so long. She's like, honestly, like all of his friends call him that anyway. So it really doesn't affect me. It doesn't bug me. So yeah, it's, it's, awesome. it's been happening for a long time. Can we please get her a pro Jersey on the back says Mrs. Nutsack. Yeah. Yeah. She, uh, the, one, of, one of my proud moments, I'll say, this is off season. <clears throat> we're sitting down eating dinner and out of nowhere, like we were just quiet. I don't even know. We just focused on the food. She's sitting there eating and she goes, do you think you would change your number to 69? I just think nutsack and 69 would look good. I'm like, oh my God, Lauren, like <laughs> you can't say these things. But like, yeah, it was, uh, you know, oh, she I, absolutely I can. Like, That's amazing. I looked at her and I'm like, I'm so happy I'm married to you. Like, <laughs> like, that's fantastic. That is a victory right there. That is. And then I remind her awesome. that the last time I changed my number, I was out of the big leagues within like two starts. So, yeah, there's no changing that. the number anymore. <laughs> She's like, all right, I understand that. No, we're staying right there. Uh, other quick question. Have you run into the police officer who uh, tried to throw you in the back of the cop car during the World Series parade? Not yet. But actually, this Friday, I'm bringing him out to the, uh, out to the stadium. Um, you know, I think I'm just going to have him come through the clubhouse, you know, talk to him. You know, he was just doing his job. Like, I know. Wait, are you really seriously bad. bringing him out? Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to make it like a big PR thing, but like he's going to come in. I just want to meet him, um, you know, and just say like, hey, I know you got a lot of crap for this, but you know, he was doing his job. For that. Yeah, he got a lot of crap for it. And I feel bad for that because it was me making a mistake. Like they told us don't get off the bus and I got off the bus and then he's the one taking the taking the brunt of the, uh, of the stuff from it. So Matthew, you know, I tell just, him oh, whenever you grabbed you, you were like, Oh, I'm, I'm good. Like, Oh, Oh, oh hold on. Hold on. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, you I mean this. You mean- and I, mean, <laughs> I did. I had a few adult sodas. So like I was off the bus running around. I, the fans look like they're having a great time. And I'm like, I'm going to go party with the fans. I like, guess looks like a freaking, I look like a great time. So I get off the bus giving high fives. And all of a sudden I see a guy like, I feel a guy grab my arm and I'm like, Oh, man, okay. Somebody really wants a picture. So I turn around. And it's the cop grabbing me. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, 
so as I turn around, he like turns my arm more and I'm like, Oh, he doesn't want a picture. Okay. So he puts my hand, his hand, my arm behind my back. The whole front office is in like the bus right behind us, like right there. And they're all screaming like, no, don't hurt him. Like, oh, <laughs> stuff. like, oh no, you're going to break his arm. Um, as long as you're right. I'm just sitting there and I'm like, yeah. once I realized what he was doing and I'm like, okay, like, Hey, my credentials are in my front right pocket. It's like, okay. He pulls him out and he's like, what the hell are you doing off the bus? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> obviously like it was a bad choice. It's like, get back on the bus. So by that time, the security guard that was with us, he'd ran down. And of course, my you know drunk fat ass had to run up the hill to the bus because I couldn't pick the downhill to get off the bus. I had to pick the uphill. So I'm running up this hill like, oh man, this is a bad decision. I'm like 200 <laughs> yards running back to get on my bus. I get on there. Luke's making fun of me. Lauren's making fun of me. Tommy's making fun of me. They're all like, what are you doing? I'm like, Dude, I don't know. I just, I'm having a good time. I don't know. But me and Luke were talking. I, I feel bad. Guy. I feel bad. Taking the jail. Time, taking the jail. Taking the jail. Yeah, Luke's like, <laughs> yeah. My wife tapped on Luke and said he's going to get arrested. And he's like, all right, well, I'll bail him out tomorrow. That's fine. I'm like, what the? Come on, man. Hey, you're lucky that since it was uphill, your Navy SEAL buddy wasn't there to hand you a medicine ball. Yeah, no doubt. Back oh, yeah. in your workout. <sighs> he would have. He would have been saying, yeah, all these people, you got to do. Yeah, he would have found some kind <laughs> of lesson I could have learned. Before we let you go, we spin the wheel of moderately interesting things. I'm not very smart. The questions aren't very difficult. All right. I'm going to fail this shit. Uh, this is okay. This isn't bad. Uh, visitors section. What is the best visiting clubhouse and why? Josh, you may start. Tampa Bay. You, you got to be lying. Bay? Oh, without a question. It's the best clubhouse crew there is in baseball, period. Really? No doubt about it. What? What do you got? They just well, everything they do, like you can't you can't drop something and they're there picking it up in this in the laundry. Or if, if you're even thinking about like, hey, I need some sanitary, they're like, like I need sand then there two two in your hand. Or it, it doesn't matter what it is, man. Like from the candy section, how nice and neat everything is at all times. Like we're wrong, they they they're dealing with the space they're dealt with, right? Like it's yeah, it is what it is. But it's not a bad feel inside the clubhouse. It's spaced out. Um, TVs, the showers, of soap. Everything is always perfect. Soap, always. Soap, man. We get soap in the big leagues. This is <laughs> nice. Yeah. I love this. Um, but sometimes it's just like that shitty ass. Like you think it's foam hand soap. So like you have to hit that bitch like seventeen times to get it. Sorry, I'm complaining about pitching the big leagues. Like going. <laughs> They're like, fuck you, Tom. You know you're a salty vet when you're complaining about soap, man. <laughs> I was going to say, you better be a shower shoe guy, by the way. Don't go in there with just the nasty feet. And listen, I, I'll get in the shower. Listen, I've taken my fair share of showers with no, no, with no shower shoes. Don't get me wrong. Oh. I'll walk around every. I'll walk around the whole clubhouse with no shoes on. I, that kind of shit. Hey, there's a reason why I don't have COVID yet, Rosie. I built my immune system. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yeah, so Tommy is excited about soap. Um, no, for me, I'd probably go with Texas. The Texas new staff is really good. Their new clubhouse, it's the new stadium is beautiful. The, the clubhouse is great. The staff does a really good job. Uh, the the, the uh, like chefs and stuff, all the cooks, they're all making very high-quality stuff pregame. I, I like going there. It's a really nice, clean place, and um, it's – it's a whole production they put on there. They got all the riddles and stuff. They got all the games. Oh, they got riddles. everything. They, they go above and beyond and, and do a really good job. That, that is true. I, I was nice. going to say Oakland. What? You're going to say no. Because they shovel shit in there? <laughs> it's like it's Winter Haven of... spring training, Rosie. It's like dirt on the floor. Stop. Like, By the way, floor. since I have you both here, hey, dirt, dirt seconds, on the floor. I, yeah, I do want to get, I want to play an extra opening wage because I'm always fascinated by this. What was your. Tyler, what was your first ever paid job? My first ever paid job? Honestly, I was drafted out of high school and did, was fortunate where I didn't have to work. So it was, yeah. it Silver was, uh, Silver yeah, I know, Silver Spoon. Oh, you Man, think it was Silver Spoon? I love it when guys first check as a high schooler is for $3 million. Isn't it great? Yeah. Yeah, that was, I'm not gonna lie, that was pretty nice. Um, yeah. But it, it went all into uh, some funds where I don't even touch it and it just sits there and, Good. yeah. Don't worry. Don't I mean, it, it was a rainy day fund for when I was, uh, you know, 16 and 17, not even playing baseball and had to pay bills and stuff. So, yeah. Hey, don't worry. Market will work its way around. We'll be back in a few years. Don't worry.
Josh, Hopefully. what was your first paid job? First paid job was um, 15, 15 years old, quality lumber yard. Uh, I worked at the lumber yard stacking. Split wood? Down split wood. I stacked wood. I had to drive a forklift around, put in the bins, stock it all. Then, you know, builders, contractors would come in. They say they want um, six bundles of two by 12, 20 foot, foot long. So if we get these, find the bundle, get take out three of them, whatever, unstack them, put them on the um, truck, and they drive off. I did that in the summer times. You getting paid cash? You getting paid like a paycheck? It was a paycheck. It was a paycheck. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we're going so, under the table cash, I mean, I was working some construction jobs when I was in high school and stuff, but it wasn't actually like on the payroll. But well, I, no, I, mean, I was not going to turn you into the IRS mom. or anything. So whatever uh, you want to tell me. Yeah. There's a couple hundred bucks here and there to go help out uh, some contractor buddy. Good. Solid. <laughs> yeah. When my I first got my first paycheck, was every, two weeks, I got 256 bucks. And I was like, oh, yeah, baby. Living high on the hall. I thought I was. And you looked at it and said, wait, who is this? Yeah, who's this, this uh, IR guy taking fifty percent? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that shit fifty percent. They might have been taking one at that point. Wait, there's still potholes, and they takes half my check. What are they doing with it, <laughs> boys? Uh, I could have kept this going forever, but I know you have places to be. Um, maybe we'll do it again somewhere down the line, so we can continue. You guys are fascinating. Your stories are amazing. Ty, real quickly, can you update Braves fans? When are you coming back? Uh, I got a bullpen today. Uh, next step will be live VP, and then they'll send me out on uh, a rehab assignment. And how long that goes just kind of depends on uh, how I'm feeling. And you know, there's check marks. We got to hit like two out of three. You got to hit back to back. So yeah, um, sometimes they make you do that. Sometimes they don't. So it'll just kind of be how I'm bouncing back, how I'm feeling. So uh, it just once the live VPs hit, go out on the rehab assignment, and then it's kind of just whenever, uh, whenever I'm I'm feeling good, looking good. But the arm feels healthy, body feels really good, and uh, I'm ready to get back out on the field. Awesome. Well, we wish you the best. We look forward to seeing him back out there whenever that happens. I know it'll be near near future, and Braves fans will be super excited. Josh, it's always great catching up with you. I always love uh, exchanging our texts and checking in on the family, and it's great to be able to see you face-to-face, brother. You too, Rosie. Thanks for having me, buddy. Appreciate it. Special shout-out to our producer extraordinaire, the one and only Robbie Scirocco, for Tyler Matzik. Or say hi to Mrs. Nutsack as well. <laughs> And for Josh Tomlin, I am Chris Rose. We'll see you next time on the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media.